To make us feel part of the service and to be able to talk to others during the service, we're going to start using the live chat function in YouTube. This can be done on a phone, on a tablet or on a computer by simply typing where it says chat publicly. If you don't see this, you probably need to log in, so continue to watch this video. In order to be able to comment and chat on videos on YouTube, you need to be signed in. This is a straightforward process where you can check easily if you're signed in and if not, then sign in. To check if you're signed in, go to YouTube either on your computer, on your phone or your tablet and check in the right hand corner at the top of the screen to see whether there is a sign in button. If you see a logo with initials or a picture, then you are likely to be already signed in and don't need to do anything else. If you need to sign in, click the sign in button and log in with an existing Google account if you have one. Mm -hmm. This could be the account you use to log into an Android phone or a Gmail address. If you don't have an account, then simply click create account Fill in the simple details and proceed to log in to YouTube. Once you're logged into YouTube, you can then comment and chat on videos, see other people's comments, and feel more part of the service. If you have any problems, please do not hesitate to contact us through Facebook, either on the Messenger or on the page, and we'll be happy to walk you through the process to make you feel part of the service. Our 
I will sing your praises, I will sing your praises, I will sing your praises forevermore.
Good morning and welcome to Worship with St Andrew's Church, Horton Liskern in Darlington. You're very welcome, whether this is your first time with us or whether you've been with us what will be almost a whole year. Our first online service uh, was Mother's Day last year 
and although I think we're a week earlier with Mother's Day this year, it still seems quite a significant um, point to mention that we've been doing this a long time. <laughs> For those of you who've been with us, particularly over the last few weeks, um, you'll remember that we've been working our way through some materials um, about our hearts being on fire and looking at the journey towards the cross and Jesus' resurrection um, with starting points at the road to Emmaus, so that, that back to frontness. Last week we were framing this within the phrase face to face, so we talked about encounters with God and how that affected our relationships with each other as well as with, with our Heavenly Father. This week our little uh, strap line really rather than face to face could be heart to heart um, quite appropriate on today that's Mother's Day of course. Um, it does seem right that we should acknowledge that for many there's a tension around Mother's Day um, whilst we can say our hearts are full of gratitude and love for those who've mothered us there's also a, a sense of our hearts being filled with sorrow, perhaps for mothers who are no longer with us, for perhaps the fact that we've not been mothers and would have liked to have been, or perhaps we've not been the mothers that we wanted to be. Um, and our service today spends some time framing these contrasting emotions as we look at God's relationship with his people and also in the experience of Mary, Jesus' mother, who herself, of course, witnessed great motherly joy and experienced great sorrow too. So I do hope this will give you some chance to reflect um, and to remember. I'm going to hand you over now to Lewis to read us our first Bible passage from Psalms. Our first Bible reading this morning comes from the Book of Psalms, which picks up on the themes that we looked at last week of looking at God face to face and wrestling with God with our thoughts. And it goes as follows. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I sing to the Lord for he has been good to me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today, we're looking at heart to heart, sorrow and joy. And according to the Bible, in both the New Testament and the Old Testament, one of the most dangerous things we can be, one of the most regretful things we can be, is hard of heart. Hearts can and should be set on fire, as we've been thinking about through these weeks of Lent. They should burn within us. We should feel that passion, whether that be in sorrow or in joy. Sometimes hearts must be broken. Sometimes they must be filled with laughter. But hearts should never be hard. The institution of the Christian church is very established, very formal, particularly the Church of England. It can become quite dry, quite dull in its kind of organisational structures. But that masks what our faith is really all about. Our faith should never lose sight of the fact that our faith is one of emotions, one of feelings, one with our heart at the centre. Because our heart, our feelings, our emotions really are what make us human. They are at the heart of our humanity. To be human in all our mess, in all our joy, in all our sorrow is what makes us 
human. Our humanity is part of our discipleship. It is who we are. But what of our God? What of God, the God who we worship week in, week out, we believe to be mighty, to be powerful, to be majestic. Can we get to grips with a God who will also suffer? A God who will also feel those emotions of sorrow, of loss, of abandonment. Emotions can make us vulnerable. Can we get to grips with a God who can be vulnerable? And can we get to grips with a God who, because of that vulnerability, because of those emotions, those feelings, can change? Because it is perhaps here that our Christian faith differs from most of the other main religions in the world. Because for other religions and for those ancient Greek scholars and intellectuals, divinity of God, the divinity of God, was about being omnipresent, all-powerful, omnipotent. It was certainly not about suffering, about changing or about feeling. But our faith is different. The Bible shares a story of God who shares in human joy and in human sorrow. God delights with us and he grieves with us. It is in the Bible a reality that God is shown as a God of compassion. And the Bible tells us that God will suffer with his creation. One of the narratives in the Bible, one of the stories in the Bible that tells us about God's vulnerability, God's emotion and God's changing is in the account of the flood, the story of Noah in Genesis chapter 6, beginning in Genesis chapter 6. What we often think of as children is the two by two, the animals and the rainbows. Look, young people love this story, two by two. But in some ways, actually, unpicking the story is really quite challenging because God makes a decision. God makes a decision to take out the world, an evil world, a world that was lost. He will destroy the world because of his anger. His anger at human creation is enough that he will and is willing to destroy it. And of course, the anger or the wrath of God as a reason or an excuse for the destruction of people, for the destruction of places, is still today at the forefront of the actions of many fundamentalists of religion. The Old Testament scholar Trevor Dennis tried to make sense of the story of Noah as imagining the ocean that the ark sailed on as an ocean made from the tears of God. Interesting that heart is at the beginning and the end of the story. In Genesis 6, we read that God saw the inclination of the thoughts of human hearts was only evil. And in response, it grieved him. It grieved God to the heart. Walter Brueggemann, an Old Testament scholar, described this as a heart to heart between God and humankind. In these verses, we meet God who wishes to stand with his people, with his creation. He doesn't want to stand over them in judgment. He's not detached from them in that way. He's intimately caught up in his people, in his love for his world. And he makes a painful decision. The terrible nature of the flood, the destruction that it leads to, is not an easy story to come to terms with, but it perhaps is easier to make sense of if we understand that God was in pain at these actions, at this decision. And of course, it's also important to understand that the God we meet in Genesis after the flood is changed. He is one of the points in the Bible of a God who can and does change. And that would have caused suffering in the process. Change is always difficult. 
The God we meet after the flood offers the rainbow covenant. He pledges, he shall never again be a flood to destroy the earth. That's in Genesis chapter 9. God has changed. God speaks to himself in his heart. And we find that his heart is of compassion and perhaps regret. The flood effects a major change in how God going forward will love, care for and guide his people. He'll continue to grieve over the wickedness, over the evils of humanity. But there is a promise to himself that this, he will never again destroy it. God makes a promise to Noah. He makes a promise to his whole creation. And that will come at a great cost. The Bible speaks of God's responsiveness to people's pain. There's a prayer that people have throughout history used, or a type of prayer that people have throughout history used, and it's called a lament, often to be found in the book of Psalms, but also in other places as well. A lament is humanity's way of getting angry. It's a humanity's way of telling God that this is wrong telling God in no uncertain terms that something is so wrong with the world that God should do something about it. God himself should intervene. Jesus himself, while on the cross, in the Gospels of both Mark and Matthew, he laments. He laments on the cross using the words of Psalm 22, perhaps the most powerful words in the Psalms. My God my God, why have you forsaken me? There are many examples of laments throughout the Bible. And as we look at our own history, our world and the world as it is today, there are many who continue to lament. They lament the wrong, the injustice, the inequality, the unfairness, the harshness, the cruelty that we see around us. And yet this kind of prayer, this lament, is seen by some as a problem. Should we be speaking to God in this way? Should we be looking to our God to save us from human troubles? In the Bible, the first person to lament is Hagar. She's the Egyptian slave of Abraham and Sarah and the mother of Ishmael. She is certainly the first person in the Bible to be described as weeping. She's cast out into the desert with her son. She weeps and laments as the water runs out and she waits for her son to die. Eventually, God does hear her. With our world as it is, when we are heart to heart with God, at our most vulnerable, with sorrow and joy all around us, do we too need to rediscover the ability and willingness to lament to our God. We come now to our time of confession, a time when we remind ourselves of our responsibility to say sorry for those times when we've got things wrong and messed up. But we also remind ourselves that we have a heavenly father who loves us and blesses us with a fresh start when we are truly sorry. The confession we're using this morning is based on verses from Psalm 51. And please do join in with the words in bold type. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions. Wash us thoroughly from our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. For we know our transgressions and our sin is ever before us. Against you, you only, have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Hide your face from our sins and blot out all our iniquities. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Cast us not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation 
and uphold us with a willing spirit, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or we would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. Our sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Amen. May the God of love bring us back to himself, forgive us our sins and assure us of his eternal love. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we have received God's forgiveness. Let's say together these words from Romans 8. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor the powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus and that Elizabeth her cousin would also be with child that she packed and went straight away to Elizabeth's house in the hill country of Judea. When she entered Zechariah's house she greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard her greeting 
the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child that you will bear. But why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your voice reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfil his promises through her. And Mary's reply was one of the most massively powerful outpourings of joy ever recorded. Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised to our ancestors. Mary then stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Sarah was talking earlier in our service about weeping and lament. But they're not the end of the story, either in the Bible or for God's people today. In a deep way, they form a pattern of life that will eventually lead on to joy. Those who mourn one day will be comforted. This is intrinsic to the rhythm of life that has been known throughout human history. There are times and seasons, times when it's sad, times when it moves to happiness. And this example is expressed in the wonderful words of that harvest psalm, Psalm 126. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. You see, joy and rejoicing are the counterparts of weeping. But what exactly is joy. It's a word that's difficult to define perhaps because joy is in some way undefinable. We know it when we experience it but we're not always sure how we got there. It is certainly a word that's linked to burning hearts which is the theme of, of our series of services during these past couple of weeks. And joy isn't exactly just happiness though it may well include this. Bishop Nick Baines, the Bishop of Leeds, offers the following definition of joy. He says, joy comes when faith is alive, curiosity is inflamed, and the mind is stretched. It's quite a good explanation, isn't it? It's all about that discovering new things, being stretched, having our hearts set on fire. And in the 1980s, the Archbishop of Canterbury, then Robert Vunsey, described joy as being the holding together in faith elements of life that seem to be contrasting and paradoxical. Discovering indeed that life can come through death. The real stretching of the mind and the heart in faith. And again, there's that paradox there, isn't there? Things that are negative alongside the things which bring us happiness and are very positive. And the Scottish theologian, Donald Bailey, he once noted that paradox comes into all religious thought. Why? Because God cannot be comprehended in any human words or in any of the categories that our finite thoughts and world lives by. Somehow joy 
and paradox do belong together. One of the points where joy seems to be most clearly expressed in the New Testament is in the birth stories of Jesus and John the Baptist, as told in the Gospel of Luke, part of which we've just heard prior to this. There, too, the paradox has a role to play in the biblical story. An old woman, Elizabeth. A young virgin, Mary, but both about to become mothers. In some respects, you could say that maybe Elizabeth was going to be more full of joy because she'd been longing to have a baby for many, many, many years. But perhaps for Mary, it was still a shock, the fact that she was pregnant and she hadn't got a husband, or at least her husband, Joseph, was not quite sure what was going on. There is indeed a paradoxical quality, too, about motherhood. It does involve both pain and joy, weeping and happiness. I remember with the birth of all our three children, where, which I was privileged to be at for all three, there's that intense pain that Elaine went through as she was giving birth, and, and us fellows don't know what it's like at all. But that abstract pain and, and the, the discomfort that, that goes through uh, that process of giving birth, and yet, within seconds, once the baby's born, that complete joy and that happiness which just floods through. And certainly that was a delight for me to be able to partake in. It's profoundly caught up in the text, John 16, 20 to 22. Very truly, I tell you, you'll weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets all the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. I think it's fascinating there that Jesus himself really draws together that paradox, and particularly related to childbirth. There's also a paradoxical quality about this Sunday, Mothering Sunday, a day that is celebrated in many of our churches around this time. For some, this is a day of profound happiness. For others, an inevitable time of sorrow. It can be a joyful thanksgiving for our mothers, but it can also be painful because they are no longer with us. It can be a celebration of the sacrificial giving from our mothers, or it can be difficult memories because we felt abandoned by them perhaps. It can be the wonderful gift of being a mother or a parent. Or it might be the struggle and the pain of either not being able to have children or not finding a partner with whom to have them. Last year, Mothering Sunday fell close to the time of March the 25th, which in many Christian churches is kept as the Feast of the Annunciation, that celebrating of the announcing to Mary of the birth of Jesus, and we read it in Luke 1, 26 to 38. And then there's the Magnificat, Mary's song, celebrating in Luke 1, 46 to 55, which is the latter part of, of, of the reading from today. And many of us who are older will remember singing that at Evensong most Sunday evenings. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour. It explicitly uses the verb rejoice and celebrates the changes and the contrast that the birth of her son will inaugurate. Yet such joy must be set alongside the sorrow that is implied by the words of Simeon to Mary in the temple when he greets the infant Jesus. Having said those wonderful words, now my life is complete, I can go to the Lord. He says to Mary, the sword will pierce your own heart also. And that's in Luke 2, verses 35, verse 35. 
one true way of describing Jesus is as the paradox of God. That exquisitely painful and joyful holding together of all its contrasts, divine yet human, death and life, weakness and power, Lord and servant, meekness and majesty. It's a tension that's sometimes too great for many of us to bear, but it's a tension that becomes even more apparent as we draw near to the time of Jesus on the cross. As we journey through Holy Week in about three weeks time, as we come to that point when we recognize that Jesus suffered so painfully and brutally, and yet, we would normally celebrate on Easter day, the joy of the resurrection, that complete transformation, death to life, fear to hope. Perhaps appropriately in this week, there are two contrasting pictures for our reflection. The first is Mary and Elizabeth, and that will be shown now, and it depicts a young Mary and an older Elizabeth. They're both rejoicing together as mothers, mothers-to-be. And you can tangibly see and perhaps feel the wonderful exuberance in this life-giving image. Just ponder that for a few moments. And then the second picture is an unnamed and largely unknown picture. It's a picture of an old woman from Northern Cyprus, painted by a British artist who lived there in 1974. The old woman looks both wise and long-suffering. And Alan Amos, who was then living in the Lebanon, bought the painting from the artist John Corbridge. And that was in Bella Pais, a village near Carinia in Northern Cyprus, during the visit that he made there in 1974. And this was only a few weeks before the Turkish invasion of July and August that year, in which many people were killed in Belipaeus and the surrounding villages. And I guess we'll never know the fate of that old woman, the subject of the picture. The painting itself, however, traveled back to Beirut with Alan and survived quite a number of years in the Lebanese civil war. And when in August 1982, during the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, Alan manhandled the picture and the rest of his worldly possessions with his wife. And over the rocks they, were, they journeyed to Juniad Harbour as he eventually, or they eventually took a ship for Cyprus to escape the invasion. The painting has been with them ever since and it speaks to them of the suffering of so many peoples in the Middle East, particularly those born most deeply by women of that region. And Emmaus. How does Emmaus resonate with this week's theme of human sorrow and joy? Well, I think quite clearly, really. Near the beginning of that tale, the sadness of the two disciples is specifically referred to because when Jesus asks them, you know, what are you talking about? And they look at him and tell him, and it says in the text, they stood still looking sad. And that contrasts with the exuberance and their later joys, they understood both the very language of their burning hearts and the energy that they had to get up from that meal table after Jesus had left them and run back to Jerusalem, those seven miles, about 10 kilometers. And that was all, way, all the way uphill to Jerusalem. And intrinsically in that story, there is also this other dichotomy of Jesus being in their presence and then mysteriously disappearing. The paradox there of things seen and not things seen, things understood and not understood. And as we move through Lent and draw near to Passion Tide and Easter, perhaps that will help us in exploring the meaning of weeping and joy that can provide for us some more vital stepping stones 
on the path towards understanding the paradox of God's love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. He gave his life, he suffered and died, that we might have life. Amen. And we come now to a time in which we affirm our faith. And we shall be using a Lenten creed from the people at Patmos Abbey. And the words that you need will be up on screen. So we say together, we believe that our lives are held within the encircling love of God. He knows our names and recognises our deepest needs. We believe that Christ is the divine child of the living God and that his grace is like living waters that can never be exhausted. We believe in the birthing, renewing, enabling spirit of God who yearns over our welfare as a mother yearns for her child. We believe that God is in the arid desert as well as the green pastures and that hard times and disciplines are also loving gifts. We believe that our journey has a purpose and a destination, and that our path leads to a human glory we cannot yet imagine. We believe that in the church, we are fellow pilgrims on the road, and that we are called to love one another as God loves us. This is our faith, and we are humbled to profess in Jesus Christ. Amen. Some words for reflection. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Gratitude transforms the torment of memory of good things now gone into silent joy. One bears what was lovely in the past, not as a thorn, but as a precious gift deep within a hidden treasure of which one can always be certain. Gemma Simmons says, There is no aspect of human life and emotion where God is not present. Yet God's way of being present often confounds our expectations and our preconceived notions. Moments of joy, of intimacy, of confusion and despair can be the opportunity for a deeper awareness of God's presence. Our final words are from the 17th century English poet Thomas Traherne, who was relatively unknown until some writings of his were discovered about 200 years after they were written at the beginning of the 20th century. There's also a series of beautiful windows celebrating his life and works that can be found in Hereford Cathedral where he uh, grew up. You never enjoy the world aright till the sea itself floweth in your veins till you are clothed with the heavens and crowned with the stars and to perceive yourself to be the sole heir of the whole world, and more so because men are in it who are every one sole heirs as well as you. Till you can sing and rejoice and delight in God, as misers do in gold, in kings and scepters, you never enjoy the world. Till your spirit filleth the whole world, and the stars are your jewels, till you are as familiar with the ways of God in all ages as with your walk and table, till you are intimately acquainted with that shady nothing out of which the world was made, till you love men so as to desire their happiness with a thirst equal to the zeal of your own, till you delight in God for being good to all, you never enjoy the world.
take my life and let it be consecrated Lord to be take my moments and my days let them flow in ceaseless praise take my hands and let them be at the Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be messages for me. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as you choose. Here am I. centred around mothers in the Bible. Would you please join in with the words in bold print? Eve, mother of our humanity, teach us true wisdom that all life is precious in God's sight. Sarah, Hannah and Elizabeth, yearning for a child, comfort and strengthen all who know the pain of infertility. Hagar, condemned to the harshness of exile, sustain those who struggle to feed their sons and daughters. Rebecca, bride from a far off land, welcome women who must bring up families among strangers. Rachel, weeping for your children, weep with all mothers whose children have disappeared. Jochebed, mother of Moses and Miriam, Lend your ingenuity to women who seek protection for their children. Naomi and Ruth, bound together by a love greater than blood, show us how bitter disappointment can become the sweetness of hope. Mary, daughter of Israel, mother of Jesus, 
share with us God's secrets you have pondered deep within your heart. Amen. And can we now bring our prayers together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As a final thought today, we're just going to consider that final promise at the end of the Bible in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, where God says that he will wipe away every tear from our eye. And it's interesting to think, really, that that's a promise that God can't keep unless we have learned how to weep. It's part of the human condition. The fact that perhaps some of our lives have been more charmed than others. It might seem strange to feel that we have to embrace that sorrow. And Jacob of Saron, the 6th century Syrian saint, had this to say. You have no tears, buy tears from the poor. You have no sadness, call the poor person to moan with you. If your heart is hard and has neither sadness nor tears, with arms invite the needy to weep with you. Provide yourself with the water of tears and may the poor come to help you put out the fire in which you are perishing. So running through that is that need for empathy, for walking in somebody else's shoes, to connect with their sorrows as well as their joys, as that reflects God's relationship with us. Sorrow into joy. And we too need to bring that to our relationship with others, heart to heart. So, a final blessing, using words that we started our service with from the Church of England Common Worship. Lord Jesus, in your mercy heal us, in your love and tenderness remake us, in your compassion bring grace and forgiveness, for the beauty of heaven your love prepare us. Amen. One needs compassion, a love that's never failing, and mercy. Take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, 
and fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Yes, I surrender. Savior, He can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine the light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine a light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. So, Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. So Savior, He can move the mountains, my God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave.